Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to close out our Unit 5 um, by looking at reconstruction and ultimately, although our title says the failures of reconstruction, we're really looking at how the end of reconstruction failed so many people. That what we look at as reconstruction was both a period of time but also a concept that we had to reconstruct America based on its founding principles after the Civil War in ways that made some people uncomfortable, unhappy, um, that was going to change the social order in some parts of the United States. And when that abruptly came to an end in 1876, it led us to a 90-year period in which for many Americans, people of color specifically, will live in a United States that in many ways more closely resembled the time before the Civil War than the actual Reconstruction era. So Reconstruction is going to end for a series of both long-term and short-term or immediate causes. But it's important to understand that in those long-term causes, throughout the period of radical Reconstruction, we are seeing a white population of the South working to reassert its power and authority, which it has lost in losing the Civil War and also in this military occupation of the former Confederacy. So step by step, it's going to reclaim power. And it's going to do that at the national level in Congress through the Redeemers. And the Redeemers were Democrats from the South who had been part of the political aristocracy and the economic aristocracy before the Civil War. Many of them were active in the secession movement. And by 1872, 1874, they're going to start winning seats in Congress. Um, ultimately, once Reconstruction ends, um, they will go back to control the governments of the states that they had once um, controlled before the Civil War. But they come to power because there is no longer a national government looking to protect voting rights for African Americans. We see um, more and more voter intimidation and laws being created that limit African American participation in the franchise. Um, and then we also see that there will be um, an active effort um, to make sure that African Americans, even where they do have the power to vote, they're afraid to utilize it. Um, you can see by our map here, um, these are the five military districts um, that were set up during Radical Reconstruction. And we have the dates where states are able to come back into the Union, meaning that they have written a new state constitution promising never to secede again, that they honor the 13th and the 14th Amendments. And most states are going to do this in the first three to four years following um, the beginnings of Radical Reconstruction. But we are going to see other states, um, in particular um, Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, this process is going to happen very late. It's actually going to happen in the aftermath of the election of 1876. Um, there's going to be a great deal of scandal during the Republican presidential administration of Ulysses S. Grant. If you remember, he was the great hero of the Civil War. Um, and in 1868, he's encouraged to seek political office and run for the presidency. Um, what many Southerners called the waving of the bloody shirt. We will see in the 20 years following the Civil War that many of the Union heroes um, will come back into power for the first time in some cases, um, but their political careers will be based on the sacrifice they made in leadership um, during the Civil War. But the corruption of the Grant administration in three areas, the Whiskey Ring, the Gold Ring, and something called the Credit Mobile Scandal, um, will get conflated with Reconstruction itself. Um, and the historical narrative that will follow Reconstruction is that all of Reconstruction in its time period was corrupt because of these scandals. Um, these scandals, in many cases, were created because 
Grant himself was too trusting. He let outsiders um, influence him because they were people of money and status without realizing that they were using him um, for their own benefit. And the gold ring is a perfect example of that. Jay Gould and James Fisk, who were financiers, um, did insider trading and all of their information was coming from the president of the United States and they were able to capitalize on the gold market. What they did was technically not illegal, um, but they did set off a bit of an economic panic um, from their activities. And when it was found out that the source of their information came from the president himself, and not because he was trying to help them make money, but he was simply trying to make friends. The Whiskey Ring and Credit Mobile were both examples of where patronage had gone awry. That patronage system that was created under Andrew Jackson back in the 1820s was now strongly in the control of Republicans. Since 1861, with the election of Lincoln, um, there have been Republican presidents. And so at this point, about 20,000 patronage jobs exist across the country working for the federal government. Um, and many of them involved activities like collecting taxes, excise taxes on things like whiskey. Um, and it was very easy for unscrupulous people to be responsible for collecting excise tax, auditing a distillery, and lying about the amount of product made. If you reduced the amount of taxes by half and took a little personal bonus for your magic math, um, that was a way that your the distillery paid less taxes. You personally benefited. But who lost out? Well, the people and certainly the government because less revenue was coming in. Um, the credit mobile scandal, similar idea in that you had patronage people who were responsible for auditing this company, Credit Mobile, that was created essentially as a shell corporation to manage the finances of the three companies that were part of the Grand of the Transcontinental Railroad. For every 10 miles of that railroad that was built, um, they sent their um, receipts for reimbursement from the national government. They could essentially make those costs be anything they wanted because the people supposedly auditing their books would agree to whatever they wrote down because they were getting a kickback themselves. And so instead of it costing the Union Pacific $4,000 a month to feed its labor force as they built the railroad, maybe it cost $40,000. Um, a difference of $36,000 in the favor of credit, credit mobile minus a small fee that they would pay a government auditor for looking the other way. The Republican Party is also going to break apart. Um, the old guard that were the radical Republicans, Thaddeus Stevens, Benjamin Wade, Charles Sumner, they're going to retire or die. And the architects of radical reconstruction are not going to be there to keep it going. Um, and because of the scandals in the Grant administration, there were people who said, we need a civil service. We need people taking tests. We need these to be long-term positions that people can be fired from. But if they do a good job, they can stay in that position. No longer is it acceptable that we're giving out patronage jobs. It only invites corruption. Um, and those people were known as stalwarts, those pro-patronage people. Um, the stalwarts, certainly through the election cycle of what will be 1876, um, will manage to prevail. Um, this system of patronage won't end until there is the assassination of a president in 1882. And we can see by our cartoon here, um, it's a play on words. Um, General Grant's holding a piece of government cake and he says, let us have peace, meaning he'd like to see you know, us to return to a time when the military didn't have to occupy the South, um, that we would be a more peaceful country. And what he has are all his patronage cronies saying, let us have a peace, meaning that they want to literally be able to take um, a piece of the, that pie from the government or that cake. In 1876, Ulysses S. Grant, due to scandal and age, has said he's not going to run for a third term. And we have a new candidate for the Republican Party, Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, his opponent is going to be a man named Samuel Tilden, who is a Democrat and whose star is rising. Um, he runs really on a single campaign promise, which is that he, as president, would remove troops from the South and seek Congress 
to end reconstruction. As you can see, he wins the majority vote. However, he does not manage to win the election. As we all know, it's not just the majority vote that gives you the, the presidency. It's got to be how the electors cast their votes a month later. And for the election of 1876, well, there's a bit of an issue. Um, there are three states that technically are not part of the union. They don't have electors yet. And the decision is made in Congress by 12 men, some Democrats, some Republicans, that those three states, at least two of them, will vote in favor of whichever candidate is able to make the stronger promise about getting rid of Reconstruction. So Tilden stands to win. But Rutherford B. Hayes says he absolutely promises um, that he will end Reconstruction, he'll pull out federal troops, and the other piece of this, which is the Republicans that still control Congress, will be willing to create a bill that he will sign into law that ends Reconstruction. Um, and those two pieces coming together um, create the agreement that Louisiana and Florida two areas where Tilden had actually won the popular vote, suddenly will cast their votes for Hayes, and Hayes will become the winner. But what is sometimes called the Hayes-Tilden Compromise, the Compromise of 1877, is certainly a election outcome that was only possible with chicanery and promising away the future of African Americans in the South. My two pictures on the screen here. This is a political cartoon drawn in the early 1880s. The author is someone who we seldom see his work anymore. He was unfortunately um, quite anti-Semitic and um, anti-Black. Um, but his work is important because he is able to show a point of view that is Southern and also a point of view that is Northern, both of which seek to have something besides Reconstruction. So we tend to think those who are against Reconstruction are simply from the South. But in fact, there were plenty of Northerners who by 1876 thought Reconstruction had gone on too far or that its promises had been codified in the ratification of three new amendments to the Constitution. And so there needed to be no further expense or work done. So our cartoon that's here on the left-hand side, we see a lady here who's carrying a very burdensome weight, and she says solid south on her dress. Um, and what she's carrying is a carpet bag. And as we discussed in an earlier lecture, um, it's symbolic of this movement of people from the North, former Union soldiers in particular, who've come to the South to do a land grab, buy up um, farms that have been foreclosed upon, businesses, that have shuttered because of the Civil War um, and try to gain some sort of economic foothold in the South. Um, for Southerners, they saw that the military presence was one that they called bayonet rule because of the rifles and the bayonets um, upon them that soldiers carried at that time. But literally, she is the sympathetic figure, that she is being burdened by these policies and by Ulysses S. Grant, who rides upon um, this carpet bag. But by 1877, we have a new president. And for the next four years, he is literally, with the interpretation of the artist pen, turning swords into plowshares, an old biblical phrase. But that old carpet bag, those bayonets, um, all of those weapons of war, this idea of the bloody shirt candidate has all been plowed under so that a new um, growth, a new productivity um, can come to the country. And he has these two titles, strong government, weak government. There were people, especially radical Republicans, would have described what it took militarily and legally to attempt to transform the South after the Civil War as strong government, but obviously that was something that Southerners did not appreciate. Um, our artist is saying, in a sense, that this may be considered weak government, 
because it has ended this period of reconstruction, but he's essentially trying to make the comment that weak government is one in which there is more productivity, um, a better quality of life, a rebuilding is possible because of it. Not sentiments that we would agree with today, but ones that had great power in their own time period. We have another artist where we have Lady Liberty crying as she sees the Union shake hands with the Confederacy. And it's this compromise of 1877. And you can see that in the background, we have an African-American family that has found itself once again um, in bondage um, to Southern white authority. So the next phase in our discussion is really about this idea of how does the South go on and how do we supplant the good work of the Reconstruction era and create a period of almost 90 years where we don't see a true honoring of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And it comes in a couple of different ways. Economically, you are going to see white leaders in the South in the 1880s, 1890s, begin to reach out to investors in the North, people who already had textile mills and other factories, and encourage them to bring their production southward. Um, at a time where unions are beginning to gain power um, in northern, the northern factory system, when you see um, greater and greater numbers of immigrants, um, people like Henry Grady, who was um, a publisher of the Atlanta Constitution Journal, is going to reach out and say, come to the South. We have an Anglo-Saxon, a white population um, that'll work probably for less money than what you're paying white workers in the North. You're not going to have to deal with unions. Um, and you're going to be able to, especially textile mills and steel mills, the raw materials are right outside your door. Instead of waiting you know, weeks to have um, cotton shipped 600 miles north or iron ore from Alabama shipped 700, 800 miles north, you now can have this in a matter of hours or days. So from Charlotte, North Carolina to what is Burlington today, so across that Piedmont, region um, in the Marietta and Atlanta, Georgia area, in the Birmingham, Alabama area, you are going to see lots of factories be built. Um, and these factories are for white labor. Um, you now are going to have a white working class that works in factories. You'll have a white managerial class that runs these facilities, while African Americans are going to do menial work, cleaning, cooking, um, sharecropping. And so you will see again a work system based on race, much like you saw um, before the Civil War. So Henry Grady, as you can see from his words on the screen, was not seeking to help the, the, all of the population of the South, but he was seeking to help improve whites and their working circumstances in that time period. But it was all called the New South. And if we're talking about the New South, we're talking about a departure from the Old South in such a way that we don't even have to think about the way things used to be. We're focused on the future. And some other pictures to make it clear that the labor force is going to be divided by race, as we can see our factory in the rear, and we can see our sharecroppers who are working in the field not far away. Um, you can also see from our map here, just in North Carolina alone, we're going to have some counties where the vast majority of African Americans are going to be bound to the land once again, and a white landowner through sharecropping, and whatever lien is held against their crop annually. That's not to say that all African Americans had that fate in the South. Um, there will be about 40,000 African Americans who will leave between 1878 and 1880. They are known as the Exodusters. Um, 40,000 is a relatively small number when you consider the nearly 4 million African Americans living in the former 11 states of the Confederacy. But it's also a large number when you consider that there were 
lots of people who were already by 1878 bound by contract, um, by debt to white landowners. So these 40,000 people are those who were able to leave. Um, they may have been able to raise some capital um, to help them make their migration to Kansas, Oklahoma, Colorado, to places where the land was um, free or virtually free. Um, in some cases, you just had to work it for five years for it to become yours. Um, cities like Tulsa, Oklahoma will come out of this exodustra movement. Um, it's the brainchild of a man named Henry Adams, who was from Louisiana, former slave, um, but became very um, astute, well-educated um, by his own means, um, and saw a kind of a grassroots method to try to help African Americans get out of the South. He saw the Compromise of 1877 in a very damning light. He believed that the future for African Americans in the South was not a future. It would be a return to the ways of the old days before the Civil War. Um, and certainly could see this through the black codes that had already come into being um, terrorist groups like the KKK, the White League. Um, and so his goal was to help um, as many people of color um, go west of the Mississippi River and to try to create a new place and remove themselves from that white oppressive authority. We're also going to see the cultural narrative historically about how we present the Civil War and Reconstruction begin to change starting in the 1880s. Um, what becomes known as the lost cause myth. And so it's not about secessionism, it's not about slavery, but the war itself becomes attributable to white people in the South believing that their way of life was threatened by individuals like Abraham Lincoln, by the Republican Party, that the South was invaded. And to a certain extent, you could spin that very easily when you think about the vast majority of battles were fought in the states of the Confederacy. Um, and that it was just a lost cause. And we take out, we sanitize, we don't have this issue of slavery when we speak about it as a lost cause. Um, the South was merely, people died for what they believed was their way of life. Not that you had a war because you had an oppressed group of people. You will see organizations like the Daughters of the Confederacy come into being. Um, and part of that is if you were a person who had served in any part of the Confederate Army, there was no pension for you. Um, there was no national monuments for you. And so the Daughters of the Confederacy was an organization that sought to honor those dead um, and began to fundraise significantly to build monuments. And we'll see a whole monuments movement um, that begins in the late 1880s, um, and it kind of begins to peter out as we get into the Great Depression of the early 1930s. Um, but the monuments to those heroes of the Confederacy, people like Robert E. Lee, um, they're built quite some time after Reconstruction. And again, they become symbolic, um, and they become another form of storytelling. Um, we will also see that in the cultural consciousness in terms of entertainment, um, what will be the film in 1915 called Birth of a Nation um, had an earlier history as a book called The Klansman um, and a popular play that traveled all over the country. Um, but it is a story in which Reconstruction is presented as a time in which white Southerners were terrorized by African Americans who were out of control, by a Union army that sought to oppress them. And the storyline of the film and its source material is that in the heart of Reconstruction, it's a fictional story, but they believe that they're telling what was the reality of the day, and it's certainly presented that way, that you have a town, southern town, where um, African Americans are in control um, that there is violence against white women, and that to seek justice, a group has to be formed um, known as the Ku Klux Klan because the occupying federal forces will do nothing to help these oppressed white people.
And that may seem crazy that that had entertainment value, um, that it had any credence, but often we see that what are the products of entertainment um, become part of the cultural narrative uh, and sometimes assert themselves as truth whether they are or not. Um, state flags that begin to incorporate the stars and bars. So this is Mississippi's flag from 1894. And yes, it is the flag they flew until a few months ago. Um, the state of South Carolina won't add these stars and bars until 1960. Um, and about eight years ago, um, will change their state flag. But it takes these symbols of the Confederacy and says, oh, they're not about slavery. They're about sentiment. They're about a lost cause. They're about heritage. But obviously, these are things that are going to be viewed by other people as the tokens and memories of an oppressive way of living and one which did not recognize the equality of all people. You can see some samples here on our screen. These are all from textbooks that were published um, in the 20th century up through um, the late 1960s. And we see everything from um, a publication of slavery as a positive good. We see that the legislatures that were created um, during the period of Reconstruction labeled as corrupt um, you can even see words like carpetbagger and scalawag um, being used. And these, again, are part of text that was presented to teenagers. Um, the Confederate Army and Navy did all that they could based on the fact that they had a love for their homeland but limited resources. Um, they fought to the best of their ability. Um, our last passage says that Essentially, the African Americans came to see themselves during Reconstruction as entitled to free land and to food, and that these were things just given to them by the Freedmen's Bureau, as though people who had had nothing and needed assistance in terms of um, achieving any sort of sense of quality were somehow not deserving of it. But this is how we build a cultural consciousness where generationally you will have people who, if you ask them what was the cause of the Civil War, they can tell you it's not slavery. And a generation of people who say, well, how is it not? But part of that is because of media, of um, educational texts. Um, we see that there is a culture being created in which we tell a different story. Um, and the story of the Civil War, not from the perspective of the oppressed, but from the perspective of those who started it. How this relates to today? Well, I mean, we've been talking quite a bit in the last year or two about what we name things. Um, and in many cases, we have streets and civic buildings that have the names of what were once Confederate heroes. Um, Zebulon Vance High School. Um, Zebulon Vance was um, a Confederate governor of North Carolina, was a Redeemer senator and congressman. Um, the school that is named after him was only built in the last 40 years, um, and it was renamed in 2020 um, for Julius Chambers, who was part of the NAACP and legally helped bring about integration um, to schools here in North Carolina. But there's a historical legacy, and there are people who question, you know, should we name civic buildings? for people who were part of this culture that wished to see the subjugation of a specific group of people based on skin color. Um, these are questions that obviously we, we won't answer today, but just to give you a sense that um, we do see vestiges of the lost cause myth and culture um, still in our world today. Um, monuments being built, lynchings, these events, begin to pick up steam in the 1880s. And you see a very interesting phenomenon that at times where you have high numbers of lynching, you see relatively few monuments being built to commemorate the South. And, and you see quite the opposite, where you see a lot of monument building, you see limited lynching. And, I, and I'll give you um, perhaps an explanation from this, which is if I drew a third line, which was um, showing us the economy from 1880, to 1960, you would see that it almost in full 
traces the line of the monument building, meaning times where there's high unemployment, low to negative economic growth, very few monuments are built and there are far more lynchings. At times where there's very low unemployment, a very robust economy, uh, very little national debt, um, we will see lots of monument building and relatively few lynchings. But these things all work together, that the, the culture, the economic piece, the political piece, that these are not really separate entities, um, but they all function in tandem. Um, we spoke on an earlier lecture about um, debtor peonage, um, what was sometimes also called the convict lease system, um, where blackmail labor um, was typically um, used once people were found to be guilty of some civic infraction, given a high fine to pay when they couldn't, someone paid their fine for them, and then they became legally bound to them for a period of time for work that was unpaid. Slavery, by another name. One of the first people to really untangle that idea and look at how in many ways black labor being controlled by whites was still happening after Reconstruction, but just in slightly different ways. Um, and also the phenomenon of lynching as it was ever increasing starting in the 1880s um, is attributable to a woman named Ida B. Wells. Um, she was an African-American journalist. Um, she printed, um, published one of the first books about lynching in the United States um, and wanted to make it clear to her audiences for people who thought that changing the Constitution three times was enough to actually afford equality um, for people of color, that that was far from the case. Our pictures here um, are all examples um, from North Carolina where lynching had taken place. And sometimes um, I find students believe that lynching was rare and that lynching must not have been very public because it's so horrific to think about people doing such a thing. And the sad thing is it's quite the opposite. Um, our News and Observer, this is the Charlotte News and Observer from 1898, publishing a story about a lynching that took place and a justification for why this lynching took place. Um, in Wilmington, there were a series of riots and lynchings that took place um, in the 1890s. Um, and these were publicly known. If you went to a lynching, you could typically buy a souvenir from the victim. Um, and that usually meant a piece of the victim's clothing or body. Um, people took photographs and sold them as postcards. Um, publicly seen, the federal government felt at the time it had no role in stopping that they were state matters and unfortunately it was an issue that won't really be addressed directly until the 1950s disenfranchisement so when we talk about it as voting but legally that is the concept of the franchise when i participate democratically in the franchise i'm able to register to vote i can participate on the jury and the legal precedent today that's been established since the 1960s is that there should be little to no obstacle in a free society for one to be able to participate in democracy. But there were lots of hurdles that were legally constructed for African Americans in the years following the end of Reconstruction. If Southern states had simply written laws saying African Americans were excluded from the franchise, that would have been easily overturned by the Supreme Court. But by creating laws in which you made the, some kind of accountability or burden that had to be served by African Americans, those were allowed to stand as law for a very long time. Grandfather clauses were based on the principle that African Americans would have to prove that th they had a family member who could vote in 1860, and if they could, they then could have the right to vote. Obviously, there are no states in the United States, not just the 11 states of the former Confederacy, where an African-American would have voted in the election of 1860. Um, this will be overturned in the Williams case in 1915. Um, poll taxes and literacy tests will live much longer. They were both obstacles placed for 
African Americans to overcome and typically were insurmountable. Poll taxes were based on an idea that you had to pay some sort of tax in order to be able to vote. Now we saw in the 1830s and 1840s that being undone legally across the country, um, but it raises its ugly head again in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, most Southern states will pass laws saying that as long as you have paid taxes currently on assets, you are able to vote. Um, vast majority of African Americans don't own their own property. And so in lieu of those taxes, they are expected to pay a poll tax. A poll tax had to be paid in cash. Um, and few African Americans would have had access to cash based on the sharecropping and contract labor systems of the day. Literacy tests um, were not simply acknowledgments of one's ability to read or write. Um, they typically involved um, being able to answer very challenging questions having to do with math or logical reasoning. Sometimes there were questions that actually could not be answered in any sensible fashion. Um, they were usually open-ended. They were not multiple choice. Um, Sometimes tests actually had instructions and words that weren't even in English. They weren't a test to see whether someone had a competency in literacy. They were used as an obstacle to prevent voting. Most whites did not ever have to face the barrier of a literacy test simply because in states they passed laws saying that African Americans had to demonstrate that they had at least an eighth grade education. That would have been very challenging for most African Americans because the public school system did not educate up to that age. Um, and so the literacy test was supposedly used in lieu of being able to show that evidence of being able to read and write through some type of formal education. Poll taxes and literacy tests will not be seen as unconstitutional until the creation of the 24th Amendment in 1965. The period of time following the end of Reconstruction through the 1950s is often spoken about as Jim Crow. What does Jim Crow mean? Well, Jim Crow was actually a figure um, that was part of minstrelism, um, which was a form of entertainment um, popular in the antebellum era, primarily, in which you would have white actors who would wear blackface and pretend to be African-American characters, usually in a mocking fashion. Um, and in a sense, why was the period of time after Reconstruction called Jim Crow, well, it's to speak to the fact that it was based on the perception that whites had of African Americans. Um, Jim Crow segregation certainly existed in the South, but we will see that the decision that's made in 1896, the Plessy v. Ferguson decision, um, that separate but equal is a reasonable interpretation of the 14th Amendment, will apply across the country. We will see school systems as far north as Boston and Chicago um, being segregated. We will see other people besides African Americans being segregated from the white population, um, people of Mexican ancestry out in California, Arizona, New Mexico, um, Texas, we'll see um, Asian Americans um, in California, Oregon, and Washington um, living under these codes of separate but equal. So it won't just simply apply to African Americans. But this is a trajectory that the country has been on since the 1870s. Even the 1875 Civil Rights Act said it was acceptable to have separate facilities for schooling, for churches, and for cemeteries. Um, the Supreme Court over time will hear a series of cases about the 14th Amendment, which will finally conclude with this 1896 decision. Um, but Homer Plessy was an African-American man legally because he had great grandparents who were African-American, but he was relatively light-skinned and passed for white, was able to buy a ticket to ride in the first-class car, um, which was only available to whites, um, announced who he was and what he was legally, and found himself arrested for the sole purpose of challenging this law. Um, the Supreme Court obviously did not find in his favor, um, but said that the state of Louisiana, where he came from, um, 
had made reasonable accommodation. They had provided services for both black and white. He chose to violate the law and those services, um, and he therefore did not win his case. And just to give you some more pictures that you can see um, the degree of integration um, that existed in this case, it's 1875. Um, but when we compare that um, to a period 35 years later, um, we can see that we truly do have segregation. Again, this is in the Charlotte area um, um, and what would be uptown today. So we're going to conclude with um, something we'll pick up back in Unit 6 and Unit 7. Um, but there are going to be different intellectual leaders who are going to be looking for a path forward out of this highly segregated and um, legally limited way of life that has become the norm after it. Reconstruction ends. Um, somebody who will be vitally important in encouraging um, higher education for African Americans. He will um, help build what is known as Tuskegee University, which for a very long time was the premier university for science and engineering for African Americans. Um, Booker T. Washington will begin by the 1890s to speak about the idea of racial accommodation, meaning that African Americans have to accommodate white racial prejudice. They are the minority population. Um, and the white population, at least at that point, is not ready to see any kind of equality economically, socially, politically. And his argument was that African Americans, however, could focus on one of those facets. They could focus on economic opportunities, um, education in their own schools, and that at some point in the future when the white public was willing to recognize those accomplishments, the social and the political equality would be forthcoming. He will speak about this um, in 1895, um, and this idea um, will be one that he'll promote for the rest of his life, but certainly by 1915, um, although there are some well-to-do economic enclaves in places like Durham, North Carolina, Tulsa, Oklahoma, for the most part, African Americans are going to be relegated um, to menial work and agricultural labor. Um, relatively few African Americans will have um, high school or college education relative to um, their white counterparts. Um, and it really won't be until 1915, with the beginnings of what's known as the Great Migration, where we will see um, white employers in the North, but especially in factories around the World War I era, um, willing to hire African Americans, needing to hire African American labor. Um, and about 300,000 people will leave the South, um, and those African Americans will begin to build communities in places like New York City and Chicago and Detroit. Again, they will still be racially separated enclaves. Um, but just to give you a sense of what would be um, the educational institutions for African Americans, the picture in the lower portion of my screen here, um, a one-room schoolhouse was still typical in most rural areas um, in the country, but this was a public school in Charlotte for African Americans. Um, in 1910, um, and it was a much more primitive structure um, than whites, um, white students would have had at that time in Charlotte. So as we conclude today, we want to think about as we come out of this period following the Civil War, was one, how did the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, um, what were they able to do, and in what ways were they limited? So they're certainly ratified. These are changes made to the Constitution. But why are they not transformative in the way that they were intended? Um, to what extent was Reconstruction a dream deferred? That's a, a quotation um, from a, a poem that will be written in the 1930s by Langston Hughes. But Reconstruction, those values, they live and attempt to gain momentum 
between 1867 and 1876. And then we have this dormancy. And what we're going to look at as we move along in this course is how those will become realities, but it will take a almost a century before we'll begin to see real economic, social, and political justice, um, regardless of race. The other piece of this is how did the economic and social and political failures following Reconstruction, what were the long-term consequences for African Americans? Um, in what ways will it limit African American life? And in what ways um, did African Americans overcome those challenges? Because they certainly do. Um, and then the last piece is to what extent are we still living with the legacies of that era? Um, we're still talking about monuments and state flags, um, what we name buildings and streets. Um, how do these things still impact um, how people see themselves as part of a, a unified America in 2020?